Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Did you notice it? Or has it become so commonplace that you don't even think about it anymore? As you were eagerly participating in Brown Thursday, Black Friday, and Small Business Saturday, I'm willing to bet, because I myself heard it, that you heard jolly pop Christmas music playing over the speakers. Everything from Bing Crosby to Britney Spears singing out about this most wonderful time of the year. Even on Cyber Monday, where in theory you can shop in your pajamas, but we all had to work, so more likely from your desk, we couldn't click on a site without seeing vestiges of secular Christmas wherever we went. Now, folks, I, I get it. Those five days are sort of set aside to get people ready for their Christmas shopping. But backtrack a month earlier, the day after Halloween, and I was a little dismayed to see tinsel and Santa merchandise sitting next to the old, unpurchased Halloween costumes. Why do we have to begin so early? Bums me out. I want to alert you to a conflict that takes place this year. Well, every time this year. Every year this time. Both in the culture and in the hearts of Christians. We sometimes call it a war on Christmas. It offends us that we can't say Merry Christmas when the season really is supposed to be about Christ, right? Instead, we have to say Happy Holidays or Seasons Greetings or something similarly bland. We see so much tinsel in Santa merchandise that we often experience, well, a sort of righteous anger towards the culture and on behalf of our Lord. He is the reason for the season, after all. That being said, there's actually another war being waged right now, and it's one that you probably have never noticed because it's so effectively fought on the other side. In a recent article entitled, Forget the War on Christmas, the War on Advent is even worse, writer Molly Ziegler Hemingway observed that while we certainly can't ignore the secularization of Christmas, we must admit that almost everyone is celebrating something on December 25th. There are very few people ignoring this most exciting of all holidays. For those of us who observe the church year, who observe the liturgical calendar, and you're going, Pastor, what's that? Well, it's the reason you know we should be blue right now instead of green, okay? It's the reason our readings change a little bit in the season of Advent. We know, we recognize that Advent has almost been completely stolen from our lives. And uh, the sad truth is we may be culpable as well. I mean, if we attend three to five Christmas parties during the month of December and take down our Christmas tree on December 26th, which is, for your information, the second day of 12 days of Christmas, then what will the world think of Advent anyway? If we won't stand up in defense of it, who will? Nobody. So in order to help us defend Advent, I thought it might be good to first define Advent. The word Advent... You may wonder where these words come from. It actually comes from the Greek word parousia. Do you hear it? I don't hear it. Also from the Latin word adventus. There it is. And it means coming. This is the season in which we anticipate the coming of our Lord Jesus into the flesh. Advent, as you know, is the beginning of the church year. It's a celebration of the beginning of Jesus' earthly life. I hope you'll notice that Advent hymnody, and we've already sung a little bit of that Advent hymnody, is very rich. It's distinct from Christmas music, and it sets the tone for Christ's incarnation, his coming into the flesh. Now, one thing we do know about Advent is that there's a wreath, right? Wreath, wreath, wreath. That's the only thing we know about Advent. And fortunately, I've been in that boat myself. We light a new candle each week, and each week has its own significance. Now, it's traditional significance, not biblical significance, but I think we can find biblical significance in it. So I want to take each of these Sundays in Advent separately, and I want to give you a little bit of a primer on what makes this time in the church year so special. 
The first candle, which was lit last week, represents hope. Hope. So what do we hope for? In what or in whom do we place our hope? Well, we hope for lots of things. Daily, we hope for success, for love from others, for popularity, for every manner of earthly blessing. Now, it's regrettable, but it's also natural that we should want for those things which are not ours and that we should want to hold on to them once they are in our possession. But we also know that such hope is not well-founded. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells his disciples, Do not worry. There's a sermon right there in three words, right? Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Do we think about those things this time of year? Uh, yeah, we sure do. For the pagans, the unbelievers, run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. In the hymn, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence, which may not appear in your top five all-time hymn list, but it is a beautiful hymn. We're going to sing it during communion this morning. We confess these words, and before we confess them in song, I want us to confess them by speaking them together now. King of kings, yet born of Mary, as of old on earth he stood. Lord of lords, in human vesture, in the body and the blood, he will give to all the faithful his own self for heavenly food. You see, we Christians are hopeful. It's a good thing. We're hopeful of the victory that is already ours in Jesus Christ. Hopeful for life everlasting. Our hope, after all, is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Peace. Peace is the candle we light this week. Peace is what we think about this day. And truly, this has become the most ironic of all the Advent emphases. Who has peace this time of year? Everything is chaos in December, and let's just be honest, most of it is self-induced, right? You don't have to do all that stuff. But sure I do, Pastor. No, you don't. Believe me, you don't. We try to fit so much into the month of December that we barely have time to enjoy each other, which is sort of what we're trying to accomplish, or to celebrate our Lord along the way. And then when January arrives, we berate ourselves for packing on a few pounds, because if you don't, you're rare, the rest of us do, or for spending too much money the month before. We bind ourselves to resolutions, and I'll speak more to that on New Year's Eve. Yeah, you get me then too. Resolutions that, uh, well, they leave us feeling unsatisfied, even worthless for weeks or even months until we finally give up and just go back to the way we normally live, right? I'm in the same boat. Christ promises, promises, doesn't suggest, but promises in John 14. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Who is he talking to? His disciples. His disciples who had come to rely on Jesus, understandably so. He was about to ascend out of their midst and they would no longer be able to reference him in the flesh, so to speak. And they were understandably troubled. Jesus promises to provide for them, to give them the Spirit, to sustain them until His return on the last day. And believe it or not, we are not looking forward to the birth of a Christ child in a manger. Folks, this has happened. We celebrate it each year, but we are looking forward to the last day when our King returns to claim His sheep as His very own. The fulfillment of this promise is what we celebrate this season of the year. In the words of the great hymn, Prepare the Royal Highway, this one we've already sung this morning, we proclaim this. Let's read this together. His is no earthly kingdom. It comes from heaven above. His rule is peace and freedom and justice, truth, and love. So let your praise be sounding for kindness so abounding. Hosanna to the Lord. 
for he fulfills God's word. Hosanna. Hosanna from the Hebrew word meaning save us. We shout to our triumphant king. We find our peace in the only lasting peace, namely Jesus the Christ. If you're like me, you would give just about anything for peace this time of year, and yet that's not good enough for our Lord. The third week of Advent rises above mere peace. Peace, you set your aim too low. The third week of Advent, sometimes called Gaudetta Sunday, is all about joy. Joy. Now, the candle for Gaudetta which means to rejoice in Latin. All these good Latin words come out of these liturgical seasons. Is rose-colored, and have you ever wondered about that? It's an odd-colored candle. We hear about it once a year, and it's not enough for it to stick. So every year we go, what's with the rose-colored candle, right? Well, traditionally, the color for Advent was purple. Now, we've changed it to blue to set it aside from Lent, and I think that's fine and appropriate. But the rose is a mixture of the purple and the white, the white of the Christ candle, which is lit at Christmas. The writer to the Hebrews, this is chapter 12 of Hebrews, advises us. He says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. But how can we say that Jesus was joyful when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? Did he not sweat drops of blood shortly before his crucifixion? And how can Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 tell us to be joyful always? No one can be happy all of the time. Most of us aren't happy very often at all. So what are they talking about? To understand these passages, I think really to understand Advent, we must first distinguish between happiness and joy. Happiness is what we experience when we're younger at our birthday party, right? It's all breathless excitement and exhilaration, and it's fleeting. As soon as the cake is eaten, as soon as the presents lose their novelty, the happiness is gone, right? comes and goes. Joy, on the other hand, joy is sure confidence that Jesus paid the price on the cross for us, for you. As we recall his Christmas coming as a newborn in a manger, we never forget his Good Friday sacrifice, his Easter Sunday victory over sin, death, and the devil. The Advent hymn, Let the Earth Now Praise the Lord, summarizes this very well, and we will speak these words together. Then, when you will come again as the glorious King to reign, I with joy will see your face, freely ransomed by your grace. Purest joy. The fourth week of Advent is love, and love takes us home so to speak. The large candle in the center, as I mentioned, is the Christ candle. You may have noticed it's got a P and an X on it. It's actually a chi and a rho, the first two letters of Christ's name in Greek, and it's come to be known as the symbol for Christ. You ever heard Xmas, Mary Xmas? That actually originated from a shortening of the word Christ, and you don't actually have to get upset about it. It's got good Christian roots. This stands as a firm fulfillment of all that the Baptist cried out in the wilderness. He says, After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. And John the Baptist's words could very well be Pastor Trampy's words or Pastor Steve's words. You see, John pointed to a Christ who had not yet died for the sins of his people but who would very soon fulfill all that the prophets had testified. As a modern pastor, I point both backward and forward. I direct you back to the cross where your salvation has already been won for you. 
I also point you forward to the last day when the Lord will sit upon his throne and bring his children, you, into everlasting life. In the meantime, I direct you to baptism, to the Lord's Supper, which are God's great living and active promises that he loves you, that he has saved you through his death and resurrection, that he will return again to claim you as his own. In the final stanza of the hymn, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. We proclaim this love of Christ. Let us do so now. Early let us seek your favor. Early let us do your will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with your love our spirits fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, you have loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, you have loved us, love us still. And he does. His love is never ending. His promises are sure. You are sinners, all of you, and yet you stand in his grace secure. You deserve only punishment. So far have you fallen from his law. And yet Jesus was born for you, died for you, rose for you, comes for you, that you may weep and worry no more. Brothers and sisters, Christmas is coming. There's no stopping it. Nor would we want to. We love Christmas around here. We have every reason to be excited for Christmas, to be excited for the reason that we celebrate Christmas. You see, for us, this isn't merely a party or a meal or presents or time off of work. For us, this is the celebration of our God. And in the meantime, we wait with eager anticipation during these weeks of Advent. We are hopeful. We are peaceful. We are joyful. We are loving and we are loved. You see, one greater than John the Baptist has come. And he was totally worth the wait. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.